Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here yet again. Um, but suicide, of course, is a very hard thing to talk about. And uh, taking up your remark about Suzanne Costello, I, she's right in one respect, you know. Uh, there is an awful lot of talk about it. And a very great deal of loose talk, which I think is very, very damaging. <coughs> and the kind of talk that uh, really scares people off, in a, in a way, and frightens people, no doubt. Um, and romanticizes it at times, you know, just like the, the media do. And that could be a risk factor for suicide. You know, there are, of course, types of reporting of, of suicide in the media which uh, can promote copycat suicide, particularly among um, uh, teenagers. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, there is the th thought among many of us when we go public uh, to speak about suicide that the more you educate people and the more you talk about suicide, the more likely you are to normalize it and therefore lower the threshold at which people um, might uh, turn to suicide to, as it were, in their mind, solve their problems. So we always have to be aware of this. Uh, the other thing we have to say when we're talking about suicide is, you know, that it doesn't really bring out the individual who's in pain and who's in suffering or those who are bereaved through suicide. Uh, it's kind of a general thing which doesn't look at the personalities involved. And remember, of course, that every uh, completed suicide is somebody who has had a very lonely journey through life and has a multiplicity of problems and the end result is a suicide. We also, of course, always think of the last straw as being the cause of suicide, but there are multiple causes that interact. Um, and for, for all of that, and for all the science we know about suicide now, and all the research that has been done, suicide remains an enigma. And it is very difficult to understand why some people end their life by suicide, where others who are in dire straits and, and in great distress and have lots of multiple problems, they choose life. And we know, for instance, that um, the vast majority of people who, uh, end their, who, who are depressed or who are suicidal do not t attempt suicide or complete suicide. So suicide, in fact, in spite of all the publicity we have at the moment, is quite a rare event. Though, of course, if it, if it touches one personally, it's 100%, and, and that's the sad part about it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, you know, why people actually die at the end of this talk. Sorry, that sounds rather strange. I hope nobody dies at the end of this talk. But at the end of my, my presentation, uh, we'll be addressing that particular um, issue, and it's not a threat or an invitation to anybody to do so. But we have to deal with a lot of dry, some dry statistics, and I'm going to spare you a lot of the, that uh, tonight. Uh, going to my first slide here. Uh, you've probably all seen this, haven't you? And again, when we talk about suicides, think of the fact that behind every single statistic is an unnecessary death, a grieving family, an upset community, and a load of friends who are uh, very upset as well. So suicides at the moment, we reckon that, if you can read that, it's not very clear, is it? Um, that about 600 people a year in, in the Republic of Ireland end their life by suicide. Um, that has been going up a little bit in, in, in recent times. Um, in the early 60s, the suicide rate was extremely low, but we're not going to go into that now. Uh, suicide has increased enormously, be, in a way, uh, because of uh, the, the recession. And it's interesting that just before the recession started, we were very hopeful because the suicide rates were tending to come down after reaching a peak in the late 90s. So we reckon there are approximately 600 uh, suicides per annum in, um, in, in Ireland but then allow pleas for under-reporting. There are probably 20% more than that. You know, that would bring it up uh, qu quite a bit. Now, for every suicide, um, you have a number of people who uh, d indulge in deliberate self-harm and or um, attempted suicide. And 12,000 of those people present themselves to casualty departments <coughs> each year. But for all of the people who present, we find that there are probably uh, one in that there are seven more who do not present. So it's approximately 80,000 people in Ireland a year self-harm. And we reckon that uh, about one million people would have suicidal thoughts, feelings of hopelessness, and poor mental health. Uh, these you can uh, look at again. This is the WHO data. Um, these are the kind of, and we haven't had this updated by the, by, since 2008, unfortunately. Nobody's been able to do it in, in, in the headquarters in, in Brussels, but it shows you that we're quite low for on, on average 
uh, well below the average suicidal rate for suicides overall. But the startling thing is, of course, when we break that down into age groups, we find that we have the fifth highest rate of youth suicide in, in, uh, in a, among our European partners. And that's quite distressing, and we don't quite know why that's happening. Uh, nobody understands. Um, I throw, that's the main, all we're going to talk about statistics, really. But I show you this slide to show that um, uh, the, while the number of um, road traffic accident deaths has um, decreased dramatically in Ireland, the rate of suicide rates continue to increase. And more people now die by suicide uh, than um, through uh, motor accidents. Uh, why that should be, we don't know, because the same group of people tend to be involved. The people who, most of the people who die by, suicide, by road traffic accidents uh, do so at weekends, just as most youth suicides occur at that time. They're all in the same kind of age group and so on. So why is this? And this is a kind of platform we have to uh, shout, or a thing we have to shout about on every platform, uh, because you know, a lot of attention is given to road traffic accidents and road safety, and quite rightly so, and nobody begrudges that. Um, but the same amount of, of attention is not being paid to suicide. If you look at the actual budgets for road traffic accident, for road safety, you find it's about, well, it was about 40 million on the, on the last count, whereas for suicide it was uh, about 3 million. And wh why that? Are our people who die by suicide less precious to society than those who die in road traffic accidents? And remember, of course, that um, a number of road traffic accident deaths are, in fact, disguised suicides. So what we have to do is to campaign to uh, give um, suicide a, a lot of uh, thought and to uh, hound our public representatives to uh, make sure that, it is, that suicide prevention is adequately researched and uh, adequately funded. And we get an opportunity of that at every election, local or whatever it might be. Um, this, I just show you, is a matter of interest of the kind of county suicide rates which means everything and nothing because, you know, there is such a thing as lies, damn lies and statistics, and it depends how you address the, the issue. I remember um, uh, about 20 years ago, there was an article in one of the British papers saying that the Irish suicide rates for people uh, 15 to 20 had increased by 300%, uh, but in fact that involved just one, one extra suicide. So, you know, it, you, you can... Uh, deal with that in any way you like. The other thing we have to say about statistics in Ireland in particular is that rates are pretty low in, in many ways and uh, we have a very small population so there's a lot of random variation uh, between counties um, year on, year out. You know that, say in Mayo when we did some research in the 80s and 90s we found that in one year, in 1981, there were 25 suicides. Uh, People would tell me now when I asked them how many suicides there were in Mayo in the 1980s, they would say, oh, three or four, you know. Now they say it's uh, twice what actually does happen. You know, they put it in the 50s and, and 60s. So beware of that, that interpretation of statistics that you're dealing with small populations and there's random variation. And that is no console, of course. But of course, if you uh, in, initiate your suicide pre prevention program when the, rate, when the number in the year was 25 and the next year it's only 11, you think you're doing a grand job. Likewise, if you start it when, you, when the suicide rate is just 11 per 100,000 um, and it goes up the next year, you think you're doing a very bad job. But you're a prey to the numbers game and statistics don't tell you everything. You just be careful and watch them. Um, this then brings us into the, the present kind of debate we have. And again, you know, this is sociological research um, which tells you a lot about the figures and the numbers who end their own life, but not necessarily why, or why certain people do and other people don't. Um, here we have the, what's happened on average in, in uh, various countries, that as the um, unemployment rate goes down, as it does in uh, a recession, the suicide rates go up. And that brings us to the, this slide, which says that for every 1% increase in unemployment, uh, this was associated with a 0.8% uh, rise in suicide at ages 65 and younger. Similar rises occur in homicides, um, and it there's a decline in road traffic accident deaths, possibly because there are fewer cars on the road in, in, in recessions. But there's no, net physic, no significant net effect on all causes of mortality. So really, in recession, suicide rates increase uh, one-on-one one with the increase in unemployment. 
And the, a recent analysis of three studies showed that job insecurity is, is associated with 33% greater risk of common mental disorders, mainly anxiety and depression. And we can all see why. Um, the cause of concern, the, it, it, I, this is an old slide, and I purposely put this in, you see, because um, it, it, this, I think we had it at one of our conferences of the IAS in, 19, um, uh, in, in 2008, and we had just heard the report from the CSO at that time that there'd been a 43% increase in suicide rates in the first quarter of 2009. Um, so this conference was actually in 2009. Um, and we were wondering, was, is this going to be a trend? And we hoped that it wouldn't, because we hoped that we had a caring government who would make sure that in times of recession and uh, mass unemployment, that um, the government would make sure that there were adequate social services and actually ag adequate support for those who were most vulnerable and most needy. But that hasn't happened, as you can see. And not only that, but the services have been cut to pieces, particularly psychiatric services in the community and so on and so forth. And the dream that came with uh, a uh, vision for the future has not ever been realized uh, properly as yet, though there are promises that this year there will be more funding available for it. Um, people who are unemployed then are two to three times more likely to die by suicide than those in employment. Uh, that's another statistic which sometimes is hard to, uh, to, to explain. Uh, this, high, this high risk partly because people with psychiatric illnesses and depression particularly are at greater risk of losing their jobs than others. The weak, of course, <coughs> in times of recession, go to the wall first and go to jail first too as well, I think. Uh, the social impact of recessions, you, you can see this for yourself. And I leave a copy of, of the slides around uh, for people who would like to uh, read them and go into this in a bit more detail. But you can see all the things that happen in recession, unemployment, loss of income, uncertainty, loss of insurance, increased dependency, social repositioning, changes in, the, in one's role, changes in status, and, and so on. Uh, homelessness and migration then been pretty big in, in this country. Um, this is another slide then that I have to bring to your attention uh, because it is important, and it's important for organizations such as my own and for you to uh, make sure that um, uh, we're doing a job and that we are accessible and well-known in society so that people know where to turn when they're in need, uh, that is most important. Uh, fortunately, when we ask this question of, um, of uh, people, uh, a thousand people in the south of Ireland, this was in, 19, uh, in 2006, uh, we asked the question, can you tell me what support services or organizations you are aware of that are available to people who are suicidal? And the, the thing was, of course, that everybody knew about the Samaritans because they had a very high profile. Next was aware. Certainly, certainly in the south of Ireland, the uh, bottom figure there is, the, uh, is for the north of Ireland, where we've surveyed 500 people. So where is a pretty high profile and probably getting much better now, I'm sure. Uh, GPs and doctors only got eight. I'm not quite sure what the distinction was between GPs and doctors, by the way. Um, Counselling services were 7% uh, mentioned them as a possibility for help. I thought that would be much higher because counselling, again, is talked about. There is counselling, after all, for almost everything at the moment, um, whether you need it or not, that is. Um, hospitals and psychiatric hospitals, uh, a very low number there, 6%, 6 percent, uh, 6, I could mention that. Um, psychiatrists got a very bad press, uh, only three, you know, we thought we were doing a good job. Uh, the interesting thing about that is we have the same rating as the clergy. What that tells you about psychiatry and psychiatrists, I'm not quite sure, you know, uh, but it does do remain uh, a big issue, and we, we hope we can do better in the, in the future. Um, the Irish Association, well, we had a pretty low one. We should actually take that out, not to shame ourselves, but you see, we do not actually do any counselling. We don't, pro we don't uh, offer a service to anybody other than information and direct them to worthwhile organizations such as, as your own. Um, others said that. But the striking and important thing which we have to address is that of all the people um, who, who were surveyed, 28% uh, could not name any organization they could turn to if they were suicidal. So there's a huge knowledge gap out there. Um, and when you broke that down, sorry, whoops. When you broke that down into age groups, uh, you found that 
for males uh, between the age of 15 and 24, 39% of them could not mention one helping organisation. And they are a group that are perhaps the most vulnerable to suicide at the present time in Ireland, which of course makes Ireland rather unique because in most countries, the people who are most vulnerable to uh, suicide are in fact um, uh, elderly people, uh, particularly the old, old, of which I'm rapidly about to join. Um, the thing you have to know, and we go through these fairly quickly, you probably know them already and we give them in the slides, are the myths about suicide, you know, because we have to uh, look at our own prejudices and, and the way we, in our daily life, stigmatise suicide and depression and lots of other things um, and the, the kind of false beliefs that we have, uh, which I think sometimes make it very difficult for people to get help or to go for help, and they shy away from it. And there is, of course, a tremendous amount of apathy, particularly about suicide I in Ireland, you know, that there's a kind of hopelessness. Everybody's kind of enthusiastic about um, uh, preventing road traffic deaths, you know. And, of course, it's, there are lots of, sp of specific uh, practical things you can do about that, like controlling speed and uh, drink driving and making better roads and so on and so forth. Uh, which you, we don't have anything so clear-cut in suicide prevention. It's a much more nebulous thing and much more enigmatic. Uh, but we do have this myth that if someone's going to kill themselves, there's nothing you can do about it. And the fact is, of course, that everybody uh, who ends their life, or the majority of people who end their life, are people who are in great pain. And it's not as if they want to end their life so much as if they want to end their pain. Um, and... Um, if we have a, a, a positive attitude towards this and put out the hand to help, I think we can prevent a lot of suicide. So that's one myth that has to be dispelled. Um, uh, suicidal people are intent on dying. Well, that's just not true. It's not a lifetime choice or anything like that. And they say people are ambivalent and life and death are in the balance. But as people get more depressed and more hopeless, their thinking narrows and becomes constricted and they see only one way out, particularly if they think they're a burden to people and that families would be better off without them. And this, of course, is a very important issue, you know, when people call uh, people who end their lives uh, um, uh, selfish. You know, the majority of people who end their life feel that they're a burden and that people would be better off without them. And that's a very sad state of affairs. Um, Talking about suicide encourages it, and that's an issue that our chairperson tonight raised uh, just at the beginning of this talk, um, and we have to be careful about that. But of course, if we don't talk about it and sweep it under the carpet, uh, we deny people a, ch a chance to get help. We, we don't see the problem, and out of sight, out of mind is a, is a catch cry there, which is um, important to, to deal with. Um, and I, of course, when I qualified as a, as a doctor uh, way back in the year, I won't say, um, I uh, certainly believed this myth myself, and I would have been afraid to ask people uh, whether they were, they were suicidal or not. Uh, and I think that was kind of sad. But I certainly learned very quickly that it was important to talk about it, because then you opened up an opportunity for healing. So talk. Those who talk about suicide then are the least likely to attempt it. Again, that helps a lot of people to ignore people who are suicidal and uh, brush them aside because they're only, you know, only saying it, as it were. But we do know that about 80% of people who die by suicide will have um, talked to some significant other person in their life, be it a family member or a friend, about their intention, maybe directly or indirectly, so that any talk about suicide um, must be taken quite seriously. But that doesn't mean you have to rush everybody off into hospital or send them in in white coats and ambulances around for them. You know, talking will just ease the situation, as I say. With those who so that's that myth we have to dispel. And then suicide attempts are just a cry for help. Now, we'll talk a bit more about that later on because we'll be talking about specifically why certain people die by suicide and certain people don't. But we do know that one of the biggest risk factors for completed suicide is the fact that somebody has attempted suicide in the past. Um, so they're not just cries for help. It must be taken seriously. And of course, again, and I would have felt this when I qualified at first, you know, people who attempt suicide and are brought to, are brought to casualty get a very raw deal. You know, they're 
people say, well, why can't we get proper, prop, proper sick people to deal with and, and cure rather than these nuisances? And again, you know, that kind of attitude and casualty, I think, has you know, alienated a lot of people and stopped them from getting help and maybe encouraging them, as it were, to make a more serious attempt and maybe a fatal attempt the next time. Um, only the mentally ill or clinically depressed people make serious attempts. And, and that's an interesting one. Uh, it's hard to say. We say in this country uh, and in Western countries generally that uh, people who end their life by suicide, well, between 65 and 90% of those will have been suffering from a psychiatric illness. Uh, in Oriental countries, it's quite different. Only about 30% of people who end their life by suicide um, uh, would have had a mental illness of some sort at the time. So what encourages the others to, uh, to end their lives? Maybe cultural and economic factors, but we're not quite sure. Um, uh, hopelessness, of course, at the bottom of this slide here, hopelessness was always thought to be one of the, um, the uh, major risk factors <coughs> for suicide. But we do know now that it's helplessness, you know, that people do not have control over their destiny. Uh, and over their illness and how to end it. <coughs> and this was a famous one, of course, the good pumping out in A&E will teach those making silly gestures a lesson they won't forget. And tragically, of course, that was an attitude that remains among many of the professions and among the general public as well. Um, and then another myth, once a person is suicidal, they are suicidal forever. The fact is that suicidal feelings and suicidal intent are often of short duration and um, vary in intensity over time. But of course, if somebody is um, uh, taking alcohol, well, that really increases the risks enormously. Um, and then, you know, people go through phases. You have some people in their adolescence who may be quite suicidal, but that leaves them in time, and they, uh, they, they solve their problems or learn to solve their problems and their disappointments in, the, in an adult way in time. Adolescents, of course, are particularly vulnerable in many ways because of their lack of experience of life. And she killed herself because of exam stress. Well, that again is kind of a newspaper heading, isn't it? You've probably seen it from time to time in the press. But again, you know, that's the last straw. We'd never know what's, what was done before, you know. And the media tend to be very superficial in their reporting of suicide. And there have been some celebrated suicides recently or clusters of suicide, you know, where the media have really given the wrong impression and thought that, you know, these were very happy people who just suddenly decided to end their life when, of course, they had many, many problems and difficulties. Um, the, now, the risk factors, you see, what we're going to show you now are the traditional risk factors and warning signs of suicide, which everybody um, uh, talks about. And they are of extremely limited value. The risk factors which we're going to talk about are many, um, and um, uh, almost everything in life seems to be a risk factor for suicide. So that's not really a great help, but we have to go through them anyway. Um, and of course, they can be some of the risk factors are ones that you can't avoid, such as being male, you know, unless you get a lot of uh, dangerous surgery, which would be. <laughs> kind of unfortunate, um, and growing old, and that's another factor, you know, we can't avoid either. Um, and uh, marital status, well, you know, people who are single, widowed, divorced, uh, or whatever, have a higher risk of suicide than those who are, who are married. Though sometimes people would dispute that in, in, for many reasons, yes. Um, family history of suicide. Um, that's important for two reasons, of course, because we know that uh, in everything we do, there is a, 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 a genetic element. You know, we, we are we, um, a, a product of our environment and our genes, um, and they interact together, uh, nur nature and nurture. And of course, our brain is a plastic thing in the sense that it keeps developing and changing with every experience that we have. Um, a family history of affective disorders uh, is another risk factor. Easy access to means of ending life. That's why the suicide rates among vets and dentists and doctors and nurses and professionals who have access to firearms are, are higher than the general population. Psychiatric illness plays a big part in Western society, as we mentioned. And the previous suicide attempt was a big thing. Also, a history of personality disorders. Drug or alcohol abuse is a big factor. And um, 
Uh, that's why we really need to look at controlling our consumption of alcohol in this country, because about 45 to 55, um, so in, in 45 to 55 percent of suicides, alcohol will be involved in some way. Uh, some people take alcohol to give themselves the courage to do it. Other people take to alcohol to think it's going to ease their depression and it just makes them more depressed and helps them to act impulsively at times. And we can see in the study that we've done, you know, that uh, had a certain person not been uh, intoxicated on a particular night, he might not have ended his life then. Family breakdown or conflict, um, physical or sexual abuse, absence of a confiding relationship, unemployment, as we mentioned before, physical illness, um, HIV and AIDS, social isolation, living alone. We know that the suicide rates are much higher in rural Ireland than they are in, in, in large ur urban areas, which is the opposite of what you'd expect because you would think of uh, there being more um, community in, in the um, countryside than in the big cities where the, we think of them as being isolated. Um, prison suicides and occupation with easy things. In youth suicide, then, it's kind of different, maybe. Uh, uh, Hopelessness is not a consistent predictor of suicidal behaviour. Uh, they have a lot of, of course, personal, interpersonal problem solving. They, they, lack, they have poor interpersonal problem solving abilities because of their lack of experience in life. Stressful life events are difficult to cope with then. Substance abuse is a much bigger problem, of course, for young people than for uh, adult people. Um, uh, it affects the... Um, the developing adolescent brain in a very dire way that it doesn't actually affect normal moderate drinkers uh, in adulthood. Interpersonal losses are difficult to cope with. Disruptive disorders and legal problems. Uh, again, of course, I feel that a lot of young men particularly who are acting out and are antisocial, I think that's the way they express their depression. Whereas I think for women, uh, they, they can be more upfront about it and cry and um, talk about their problems and so on and so forth. Um, that isn't to say there aren't some bad guys around, by the way. Um, the warning signs of suicide, then, uh, these are the, uh, the ones that we have um, always thought were the important ones, you know, that would uh, say unexpected reduction of academic performance in adolescence, uh, ideas and themes of depression and death and suicide in their homework, the change of mood and marked emotional instability, significant grief or stress, withdrawal from relationships, physical symptoms with emotional causes, and surfing the net for chat rooms and, site, and sites advocating suicide. And that is a big worry, of course, because there are so many sinister sites out there that advocate suicide as a right, and that if you want to do it, why not go ahead and do it now? Um, and there are lots of chat rooms that encourage suicide. And there's some awful stories in the media about that. One from America where... Uh, these people were connected through the internet on, on a chat room and one of them started taking tablets and the other said, oh, go on, keep taking them, you know, which he did, of course, by their encouragement. And uh, his family were in another room in the house uh, watching television, but he was dead when they got to him, you see. So those kind of things happen. And while we're very conscious of cyberbullying at the moment, which does in itself um, lead to some suicides, unfortunately, we have to be aware of the dangers of the internet. And I think you know, a lot of parents would be kind of concerned that their uh, adolescents are s uh, surfing for porn on the internet, which might be far less sinister than the suicide sites, suicide um, advisory sites that they, that they meet. Um, and of course, young men being particularly vulnerable in this respect because they, of course, are large surfers of the net. And if in a moment of deep depression and despair they come across one of these sites, they will say, well, that's, that's my way out. That's my solution to my problem. Though suicide is never a solution. Um, and uh, we keep that in mind. And I we had one friend who uh, wasn't adolescent, actually, but who did surf the net and de did end his life by the way he discovered on the net. You know, it's just quite tragic and unfortunate. Listening to songs of praising suicide, uh, sad music, we're told by some researchers that um, uh, p 
people who listen to country and western music have a much higher suicide rate than people who don't, you know, and then the same for people who uh, listen to heavy metal. But you see, again, when we're talking about all of these things, you know, what is cause and effect? You know, people who listen to sad, mournful songs because they're depressed and it reflects their mood, or does listening to those musics make, make people um, uh, depressed and suicidal? Hard to say. It would be difficult to know, and it would be different for every individual. Um, uh, threats and statements of intent, these, as again, have to be taken seriously. And we'll highlight that again later on. A preoccupation with a known suicide. And again, for adolescents, um, uh, it, this is important, you know. Um, the risk factor uh, is higher if they have a, a buddy who has ended his life by suicide. Um, and you do get clusters of suicides, uh, particularly in adolescents. You know, the media is responsible for, um, we'd say, uh, well, not just the media, but the rest of us as well, but particularly the media is, is a big force in, in, in um, uh, copycat suicides. Overall, perhaps 3% of suicides are copycat suicides. But in adolescents, it's about 15%. You know, and uh, you, you've seen them in Ireland, haven't you, in various counties here and in Northern Ireland and so on and so forth. And uh, there was one story I remember some uh, social worker telling us at one of our conferences uh, quite a few years ago, about the suicide in Northern Ireland um, of a young man about uh, 17. But all his mates would gather at the grave at night, at weekends, with cans of beer and lager and leave notes on the, uh, on the, uh, on the grave, written notes saying, you know, show us, uh, um, show us a sign and we'll follow you. you know? And some people did. So it is sad. But again, when we talk about it like this, you know, we must remember that the vast majority of people, you know, choose to live. Um, now, this is what I wanted to say to you then, is that a lot of research about this has been done in um, uh, America. Uh, and this bit of research uh, looked at various websites uh, dealing with suicide prevention. And all of these sites will, of course, um, have um, um, a list of risk factors for suicide. And when they did this study and uh, analyzed 200 websites and sampled them properly, they found that there were 3,266 200, 3, different uh, warning signs of suicide. You know. Now, um, everybody, of course, had, had to say in that. Uh, but I was shocked to hear, actually, that... Uh, that some people insisted on putting down as a warning sign, uh, talking to grandparents. I mean, suddenly, it's, uh, well, I have five grandchildren, what do I do? But, you know, th they can go from the sublime to the ridiculous, from the useful to the actually harmful. So we have to have a very balanced view of this um, and uh, see what really matters. Um, so the real and important warning signs, particularly for us as clinicians dealing with people who are in pain and depressed and, and who um, are um, uh, dealing with suicidal people, is to know that the really awful signs are anxiety and agitation. You know, and that's, uh, agitation is different from anxiety. Uh, people with extreme current emotional disturbance and perturbation, as uh, Schneidman, the saint of, of suicidology in America, would have called it. People are feeling helpless and hopeless and who have actually made all the uh, preparations um, uh, to, take, to do that awful act. People who have sleep disturbance and nightmares and, and perceived burdensomeness. Remember, we talked about burdensomeness earlier on. You know, the people who in their life feel they're a burden to people, to the family in particular. And those uh, uh, five things, the five points, are most important as warning signs. The rest, you know, may be quite remote. Um, and and uh, often you find that these particular situations are badly dealt with. I, I remember giving a talk in England once, uh, many years ago, about suicide. And uh, the doctor there had said, that, uh, said in, in the discussion afterwards that um, a patient of his had come to that day, said he was going to gas himself, and that he had all the uh, materials in the boot of his car with which he would do that. And he didn't think that that, that that doctor didn't think that that was a serious situation and didn't really spot 
you know, the importance of doing something about it there and then, and closing the exit, as it were, and, and so on. Um, what else have we then? Uh, so now we come to see why a small group of people who are in trouble uh, uh, in their life, and why the majority don't, you know. And we know that to, to take that big step is quite a, a difficult thing, because, you know, it's an instinct to stay alive. Uh, and what happens is, if emotional pain, hopelessness, emotional dysregulation, and numerous other risk factors for suicide are crucial, why is it that the majority of people, including large numbers of people who actually want to end their lives, do not attempt or complete suicide? You know, what, what stops them? The wonder is maybe that there aren't more rather than there are so many. Um, people desire suicide and it becomes attractive when the need to belong to or connected to others and the need to feel effective or to influence others are frustrated to the point of extinction. However, for the majority of people, the act is not accessible to them without the ability to self-harm. And the ability to self-harm is very, very difficult, and it's like a lot of things in, in life. Um, you know, the, the, the first time one self-harms, or say cuts, or whatever it may be, is the most difficult. Um, the first time you shoplift is the most difficult. After that, it becomes maybe a habit. And that happens with suicidal behavior. And the more it happens, the worse it's going to be as a risk factor. Um, desire for death is an important factor, though, and often arises from a feeling of burdensomeness to loved ones and others uh, feeling disconnected and alienated, which we've really said. And that alienation and being alone is uh, really important. It's a very isolated and happy place to be. Um, and some people have great ability to disguise that, and that's why we see so many suicides. People say, oh, well, that person was the life and soul of the party, and they have managed, as it were, to hide what's going on inside and put on a mask. Uh, and the thing that happens then is when people get used to dangerous behavior and lose the excitement that exists when, they're in the, when they're, there is danger, the groundwork of catastrophe is laid down and suicide risk increases. You know, Again, you find that a, a lot of um, uh, people who end their life by suicide uh, will have indulged in some sort of reckless behavior beforehand, like driving dangerously or taking huge risks that they normally wouldn't do, you know. I've had a few people, for instance, um, who um, uh, have driven cars wildly along the narrow roads of Ireland, hoping they would meet with an accident, um, and not caring whether they lived or died. But they lived to tell the, the tale, and I have no doubt, I have no reason to, to doubt what they were saying. Um, uh, this is the other thing then, you see, we say that suicide is a selfish thing or a cowardly thing or a sign of weakness, and Cato, the famous uh, Roman poet, um, uh, was, said, uh, was said after suicide that that was a sign of his weakness. Um, I think he was actually forced to kill himself by the emperor of the time. But Voltaire then said, none but a strong man, and I presume woman, can surmount the most powerful instinct of nature, and that is the instinct to live. And, um, and we often see this then. Um, people who have hurt themselves before, either intentionally or accidentally, overdosed, practiced uh, tying nooses, are, subs uh, are substantially at risk. Also those who have surfed the net for methods, we've mentioned that, so we needn't dwell on it here. Um, some who have survived these multiple medical serious suicide attempts, cutting, hanging, burning, and overdose. Uh, one such person said that the thing is, your body tries tried to keep you alive, no matter what you do. And that was one woman who had attempted suicide by trying to burn herself, uh, to cut herself and that, and no matter how, she, really, she couldn't really bring herself to cut deep enough. But anyway, when she said that the, the veins just closed up and the blood clotted, and she didn't bleed to death as she would wish to see. So that's the sort of thing that, that can happen. So, and you have a lot of evidence of that. Um, uh, and the sad thing then is, you know, that uh, we've had experience of this, that many people who attempt suicide by ingesting paraquat or by chloride of mercury they may survive the initial horrible experience, um, which is really bad. Then they recover for a small period and they strongly desire to live. But unfortunately, in the majority of these cases, uh, there's a second phase of the illness as a result of the poisoning, which leads to death. And it's, it's very tragic just to watch that, that somebody who's made that attempt 
and uh, survives for so long and then maybe up to 30 days in some cases and then dies because of what they've done, regretting it really very much. And that brings me to that slide. I'm sure some of you here will have um, seen that DVD, The Bridge. Have you? Anybody seen that? Where they um, did some research uh, uh, on suicide on the Golden Gate Bridge and um, they found, I think, about 13 or 14 people who survived that drop, and very few people do because it's so high. Um, and this is the story of Baldwin, you see. On the bridge, Baldwin counted to 10 and stayed frozen. He counted to 10 again and then vaulted over. He said, he obviously survived, I still see my hands coming off the railing. Um, as he crossed the cord in flight, Baldwin recalls, I instantly realized that everything in my life that I had thought was unfixable was totally fixable, except for the fact of having jumped. There was just no going back. And you just wonder how many people who do these kind of things uh, regret it when it's actually too late and there's no chance of survival. So we must that tells us again something about suicide and the dilemma and the ambivalence of the whole thing. And the fact that it's about ending pain and suffering rather than just dying. Uh, and what, uh, well, the other kind of thing we, we have to take into consideration, and as, as doctors we must do this clinically, when people present, you know, many people who die by suicide appear to engage in short-term practice, either in thought or deed, uh, for instance, in the overdosing and cutting. And, and that's something we have to explore when we're taking a history of somebody who's currently suicidal or distressed in any way and not be afraid to ask about suicide and to do something about it. Uh, the other thing then, of course, is <coughs> about people recovering from depression, uh, which is a very, very serious illness, and, and uh, the lay public don't really realize that. I'm sure everybody in aware does, um, but people can be so depressed that they can't, con they can't work out a plan to end their lives or don't have the energy to do it. But there is that kind of window of heightened risk as somebody recovers from their depression when uh, their, their mood may still be very low, but their physical energy and concentration has returned a bit. And that's a, a danger sign. And that's why sometimes we say that the, when somebody's hospitalized for depression, that the, the greatest time of risk for suicide is in the first week or 10 days in hospital and of course on discharge or being on leave as well. Um, what else? We know that from research, again, that multiple attempters <coughs> stood out from others in terms of severity and medical seriousness of the event of the, of the suicide attempt. And they had more practice at suicide and were therefore more likely to do it. Those who were more impulsive were more likely to have engaged in substance abuse, but not always. Um, the other thing then is that other kinds of abuse, physical and sexual, habituates the victim to pain, to be able to endure and suffer pain, and lowers the threshold for self-injury. So again, as I was saying, if you have been hurt once or you've been in a lot of pain, whether it's from self-inflicted wounds or surgery, uh, you can deal with pain a little bit better. It doesn't bother you so much, so you're, you can be then in danger. Um, decreases people, the abuse, of course, also decreases people's self-worth and increases alienation uh, and all kinds of violence directly or vicariously, just watching it or seeing it happen as in wartime, for instance, habituates people to pain, provocation. Um, a life history of aggression differentiates adolescent suicide victims from matched controls, even when differences in mental disorders are accounted for and what they call a crude lethality, i.e. suicide attempts tend to become more dangerous as the individual's suicidality career progresses, you know, and then you see that again in a lot of people. So it's been aware of all those things. Um, this is what, where, where, uh, an impulsive suicide uh, and shows you the danger that our, uh, adolescents are. This victim was a 16-year-old boy who had been suspended from school for misbehavior. His mother grounded him and got in, uh, they got into a loud argument. He ran from the room, slammed the door, went to the basement and shot himself with his father's rifle. And he had no known psychiatric history of any sort. So adolescents can be very impulsive. And there have been a few suicides like that in Ireland in the last two years, which are, are very distressing. And it raises a lot of problems, of course, how you deal with this, because you have to really discipline adolescents as well. The other thing then, the other one was, if you can read that, 
well, this young boy was harassed and bullied at school mercilessly, mercilessly and um, uh, people said to him, you know, he was no good and why didn't he go and hang himself? And that got so bad that he actually did go home and, and do that. And again, that means we do have to have proper uh, bullying programs, uh, anti-bullying programs in school uh, in particular and started there because it does, that kind of bullying does go on into adult life as well if we're not very careful. Um, it's a pity, really, in the sense that we now are focusing in on the cyber bullying, you know, with, because that is just really bullying continued in a different mode than before. But, uh, you know, we have to deal with bullying in general, and schools must address that. And, of course, the problem with that and with suicide prevention programs in general, with bullying pro prevention programs, is often, you know, everybody will say, well, we have this program in our school or in our hospital or whatever, but it's just a, a notice on a wall, really, and not implemented properly in, in some schools, which some are absolutely marvellous. Um, well then, what kind of treatments work? Um, and we'll look at that again, you know, but in the immediate time uh, that the person is in, the, in trouble, we need to talk in simple and understandable terms about suicide and mental health and diagnosis and all the rest of it. And that tends to be something that professional people uh, are quite uh, um, inept at in, in many respects. Not everybody, of course. Um, that we talk, as it were, in a bewitching or bewildering kind of jargon that, that, that confuses people. And there is no need for that, you know. Um, uh, and as the professions become more established or systems of counselling be become more established, their jargon grows in many ways and they become mystifying rather than simple. So we need simple language and, sim and, have, and articulate treatment models and suicidality as targets. You know, um, We have to deal, I think, first of all with the immediate thing rather than spend too much time going into the distant past, which the patient knows about anyway. And can't, we're not going to come uh, to produce anything very new. Uh, we make, make sure that people, uh, the patients are responsible uh, and can understand and invest in what has been offered and comply properly and be motivated to undergo treatment. Um, and we won't go into the various kinds of treatment at the moment, but there are many and varied and all of them complementary, really. Uh, we have to facilitate hope, um, but that doesn't mean telling everybody th that things are going to be okay. And we have to give people, of course, a sense of control over their destiny. And lo losing control, I think, is something that happens to almost all of us when we go into hospital to have any procedure done, whether it's a hip replacement or, or depression treated or whatever. Uh, we adopt the role of patient rather than person. Again, we have to reduce guilt and shame, which are big factors here. Uh, people that are suicidal have po generally poor skills but not universally so. Uh, skills, deficiency, we must look at training them, uh, targeting um, not just the symptoms, but address the kind of uh, skills that they need to have as people in society uh, and address issues, if any, of developmental history and vulnerability. And of course, above all, deal with stigma, which I think still inhibits us quite a bit in Ireland. Um, uh, again, we have to be very careful, you know, because a lot of people drop out of, of treatment. When people drop out of treatment or are non-compliant, action needs to be taken. A treatment compliance closely monitored and addressed. Motivation, ambivalence and the intent to die examined. People need to take ownership of their treatment, uh, address, address self-reliance, self-awareness and individual control. Uh, commitment to treatment is important. People to know what to do in a crisis. And many people don't, as you saw from that earlier slide, you know, where people don't need, don't know where to, t where to turn in a crisis. It's interesting, isn't it, that of those, this is about the USA indeed, of those who die by suicide each year in the United States of America, approximately 14,000 are in treatment at that time. You know. So do we say that's failed treatment or whatever? Um, or uh, was it partially effective? And how many people were saved by treatment? You know in America about 30,000 people a year end their life by suicide and about 18,000 of those use firearms which are pretty lethal and you think that if the Americans had the same gun law um, that might be avoided you know because 
if you if you use a weapon like that to end your life, there is no turning back. It's uh, more dangerous even than jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, recognize that uh, opting out of treatment represents a persistence of hopelessness and intent. Um, the issue of per personal responsibility for care is gone. The relationship to crisis management is, is uh, bad. And the implicit message you're giving, if you don't follow up on, on, on why people are opting out of treatment is, oh, well, treatment doesn't work, or that treatment is hopeless, or that you're a hopeless case, and it's all right, let's get to somebody who's going to listen to us a bit more clearly. Um, so those are the things I think that professionals particularly need to address, those last three or four slides. What people can do as um, individuals is another matter. Um, and these are the things, this is what you can do. And it is important that you do ask about suicide where appropriate and not be frightened off by it. You do know the warning signs uh, as best you can. You act calmly. And there's a lot of research now around how it, the soothing tones of voice can make such a difference in, in all kinds of uh, health problems, including suicidality. Uh, do try to be accepting and honest. Do give the person a sense of control over their destiny. Uh, do restrict access to means of suicide, uh, which is important. You know, you don't walk away and leave the shotgun there. And do get help. And above all, know your limitations and know when to get help. Uh, that's quite important. Um, in a crisis, don't panic. Don't ignore the signals. Don't promise secrecy. Uh, don't leave the person alone. Um, don't debate the morality of suicide because people you know, who are suicidal and on the point of suicide um, are in a very dark place uh, and have given up on morality, even if you like, you know. So that's unproductive. Don't tell the person to be grateful for what they have. Um, um, don't say that everything will be all right, um, because it may not be. You know, the old thing we had uh, was that we described suicide as a permanent solution to a temporary problem. But of course, that's wrong, isn't it? Because first of all, Suicide is not a solution to anything. And secondly, the person who has problems may have permanent enduring problems, enduring psychiatric illness or whatever, that isn't going to go away. So, you, you know, you can't go down that road. And don't challenge that person to go ahead. Uh, and it's, people think that that's the thing to do. Oh, well, if you want to do that, go and do it and stop annoying us or whatever. And there's been some very tragic stories about that. There was a case in uh, Los Angeles, uh, no, sorry, uh, San Francisco, I think uh, the year before last, where there was a guy standing high up on the ledge of a building threatening to jump. And uh, a lot of people gathered around looking at him. Now, he was there for a good half hour, you know, and he sort of would move forward as if to jump and uh, move back and backwards and forwards, which showed actually that he was quite ambivalent about whether he was going to die or not. But the people there were shouting and jeering at him and, you know, um, uh, telling him, why don't you jump, you know. Uh, I think one guy shouted, I want to go home for my tea or dinner or whatever it was. Uh, eventually he did jump, you know. But nobody had the wit really to get somebody to talk to him and talk him down. And uh, that was a, a kind of period of a half an hour or longer where something positive might have been done to help that man uh, take another course of action than jumping. Um, there's another awful story from uh, um, uh, Hong Kong, it was, um, where... Um, no, in, in Hungary, the, the Hong Kong one will come later, where um, somebody was on a bay, one of those big water towers threatening to jump. A uh, policeman, and there's a crowd gathered, and uh, a policeman went up and chatted to him and talked him down, right? And they were coming down. The man was going to get help and everything. And somebody in the, shout, in the crowd shouted, coward, and he climbed up again and jumped, you know. Now, the other thing we said in what you don't do is do, don't do nothing and don't leave the person alone if they're extremely suicidal. Um, um, uh, there was the other story from Hong Kong then where uh, the um, classmates of a, of a boy and a girl uh, who were in love and the parents didn't approve of it. It was a Romeo and Juliet kind of scenario. Uh, they had, the classmates got wind of it that, these cup, that this couple were going to jump from a building and end their life that way. And they um, um, followed them and pursued them and got onto the roof where the people were, the two people were, and they talked them down. They all had a long, big chat and buddy, buddy at the on the 
pavement outside the building, and they all went their separate ways, and the couple went back up the building again and jumped, you know. So remember, if somebody's in very serious trouble and very seriously suicidal, you don't leave them alone. The problem about this, of course, is um, that uh, you, you, you mustn't panic, um, and the majority of people you, who will talk to you about suicide will not do it, but they will be glad of somebody to talk to and somebody to help them through that particular crisis. Um, and mo most people who we are talking about suicide do not need hospitalization. They may need counseling and support, or they may need medical attention for illness or depression or whatever. Um, and the combination of all those things would be very important. But those are the things to remember. Um, um, these are the last kind of thoughts that we need to address. You know, that we, we need, uh, we know <coughs> that <coughs> the things that probably work to reduce suicides in general uh, are the treatment of mental disorders. So again, you know, it is sad that the vision for the future has never been implemented and that too many of our psychiatric institutions are still in the dark um, Victorian ages, as it were, and that there is such a disparity of services between various areas of the country. You have the good, the bad, and the ugly, as it were, you know, some of the most excellent services, and some that are really quite poor for lack of funding and lack of personnel. Training of primary health care personnel along the lines we've mentioned is very important. <coughs> Helplines and crisis centres seem to work, as do school-based programmes. But school-based programmes have to be really um, uh, all-embracing. It has to be in a health-promoting school. Having people go in to give a once-off sort of lecture about depression or suicide is ineffective. And talking about suicide as a once-off to a group of adolescents may do more harm than good, as this research in the United States would show. Um, restriction of access to means is really terribly important, you know, and it's again just illustrated by, would be the uh, American um, experience of uh, suicide by gunfire. Uh, and uh, that would make a big difference if the guns were restricted there. Uh, but of course, as the common means for suicide in Ireland are um, hanging and drowning, it is very difficult to do anything to restrict access to those means, though we can have. Um, uh, barriers put up in, in, in danger spots. Uh, which, which, uh, improving the media portrayal of suicide is important. Um, dealing with the social causes of suicide, combating stigma, ensuring equal access to health, long-term multidisciplinary research, which is badly needed, creating equitable, equitable access to education, because those who drop out of education from bad schools are at high risk of suicide from those who complete, compared with those who complete uh, <coughs> Uh, their education, and deal with the problem of violence in society, and so on. <coughs> Many of these, of course, are merely aspirational, and in times of uh, recession, when money is short and services are becoming uh, um, more and more difficult to access, and it's poorer and poorer because of the uh, many uh, highly skilled people who've retired uh, or being forced to retire early, um, things will go wrong. That we were losing a lot of skills in that sense in all our hospitals and services. And that's it. But we do have a list of books here, um, which you might find very interesting. And of course, you'll have a list of those afterwards. Um, and these are the, the, the first ones here. The three are the latest ones. Uh, Why People Die by Suicide has been one of my enlightening books of the last 12 months, as has this man, Joyner's um, myth, uh, myth About Suicide. We're hoping to have the uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, annual general meeting of the Irish Association of Suicidology uh, on the 9th and 10th of October next in Derry in, in uh, uh, partnership with uh, Connect Northern Ireland. And we hope to have this man as a, as a, as a, a speaker. Uh, Philosophy for Life and Other Dangerous Situations by Jules Evans is a, an amazingly readable book and very simple. And it shows you that you know, the origins of a lot of what's done in counselling today, like cognitive behavioural therapy, started off with uh, the ancients, like Epictetus, a slave uh, philosopher in Rome, uh, who made a statement, which I think was the start of cognitive behavioural therapy. He said, it's not events that harm us, but the way we think about them. And it's about how we can learn through basic philosophy and not be frightened of it, but learn how to lead... Uh, a, a, a proper life and control our 
proclivities for damage to ourselves, etc. Uh, we could, we won't mention all the others. There really are quite a, l a large set of books here that are worth reading. Um, uh, Stop thinking, start living is a nice book for dealing with negative negative thoughts. Um, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl is a very important as well. Uh, this is a uh, logotherapy at its best, and uh, the mindful way through depression. So there we are. We leave it at that. I don't know where that came from. And thank you for your attention, and I hope you'll remember some of it. You do know, of course, according to American research, that uh, if you attend a lecture like this, how, how much of it do you retain afterwards? Sorry? No, seven. <laughs> right, okay. We've